Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for um, this, I think, the second um, in our Advanced ETR Machine Learning for Health Seminar Series. Um, it's my pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Suresh Venkata Subramanian, um, who's a professor of computer science and data science at Brown University. He joined us, I think, relatively recently. Um, he's also um, deputy director of the Data Science Initiative. Um, Suresh's background is in algorithms and computational geometry, as well as data mining and machine learning. His current research interests lie in algorithmic fairness and more generally the impact of automated decision-making systems in society. So we'll be hearing more about that today. Um, prior to joining um, Brown University, um, Suresh was at the University of Utah where he won, uh, received a number of awards as well as press coverage on his work and was a member of a number of um, councils in his area of expertise. Um, and most recently he finished um, um, a, a stint in the Biden-Harris administration where he served as Assistant Director for Science and Justice in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And in that capacity, he um, helped co-author the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which we'll also be hearing more about as part of today's presentation. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to um, hand it over to Suresh, who will be talking with uh, to, to us about the role of AI and ML in amplifying health disparities. Thank you very much for this introduction, Liz, and thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be here and talk about this issue, which is um, of great interest to me personally, and that I've worked on for many years, but also in the context of health, which I, I know much less about, and I'm eager to hear from you about. So when I you know, first started thinking about this presentation, I wanted to go out and look at you know, uh, what people have been talking about in the space. And I know people in the medical world have been talking about issues around health disparities for quite a while. So I found, you know, you know, not surprisingly, um, I found um, this very nice uh, National Academies of Medicine report from 2019, talking broadly about the scope of AI in healthcare, the hope, the hype, the promise, the peril, as they put it. And it's it's a it's a very impressive report. It's, I think 294 pages long or something like that. And and obviously I, I wanted to jump straight to the section where they talked about you know the concerns and the issues around uh, AI. And there is a very broad section on that. It's a very detailed section. One thing I was disappointed by, though, was that there were exactly three references, and I searched this in, in various forms, to health disparities in the entire document, of which one was in the bio of one of the authors or one of the contributors. So there, there, even though there was a whole section on the trade-offs and unintended consequences of artificial intelligence, there was very little that was actually talking about health disparities. Now, this was 2019, so a few years ago. But I think it points to both you know, the, the fact that people have been thinking about the introduction of AI in healthcare for a while, but also that I think there's still a lot to, we can be doing to think more about health disparities. And so with that sort of having said that, I'd like to sort of start by giving kind of a general overview of the many different places that are relevant for this talk, right? There's so many places where AI gets used in healthcare, and indeed that report has a very long table discussing it. What I'd like to highlight is places where AI is used in healthcare, where I think it's particularly you know, relevant and to think about, you know, the potential health disparities. And I'll get to that in a bit, but let me start off here. So again, you know, many of these things, I'm, 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 I'm confident that you're all very familiar with, if not the specifics, but definitely the idea, the fact that you can use AI for diagnosis, especially using multimodal data, and especially doing it earlier than say um, a doctor might be able to do, right? So for example, there's been work on using AI technology to spot ALS uh, biomarkers basically by looking at how people's speech patterns that get slurred and uh, facial dysmorphia, various kinds, that might be a sign, an early uh, warning sign of, of, of the onset of ALS. Uh, people have been using AI to clean up and speed up the process of doing MRI scans so that maybe you don't, it doesn't take as long to do the MRI because AI can essentially complete the picture a bit faster. Uh, there's been a lot of work on, on AI and early cancer diagnosis, again, using multimodal data of various kinds, and another example of using um, AI guided screening for uh, AFibs. And again, all of these things are the basic idea is collect a bunch of signals, signals that might be hard for you know, humans to process, but are very sort of amenable to automated analysis, and then use AI to do that. Another place where AI gets used as a sort of a sort of a related topic is precision medicine, using AI and patient data to predict response to treatment, using AI and genomic data to design targeted treatments, and also the 
ongoing interest and growth in the use of wearable technology, whether it's just things like for your fitness or health or measuring respiratory sort of rates or heart rates, or even things like uh, glucose levels using uh, these uh, continuous glucose monitoring systems. In all of these, again, what the wearables are doing, the technology is doing is producing lots of data, some of it raw, some of it interpreted. And then that is one more mode in a multimodal system to try and infer you know, any concerning patterns. Another uh, important place where AI is, and I'm only giving two examples, but there are many more, of course, is to improve, improve clinical practice. And there's quite a wide range of uh, uh, ways in which this can happen. For example, using um, AI systems to improve the construction of clinical of electronic health records, you know, maybe by you know, uh, collecting audio information from a way a doctor interacts with the patient and putting that in the health record automatically so the doctor doesn't have to put it in, or helping doctors search for clinical information. Or even things like, you know, in a hospital system, post, uh, post op, figuring out whether, you know, sepsis is going to be an issue under what conditions for a particular patient and using essentially using AI to predict risk and then using that to guide uh, clinical care. Um, and, and again, separately from all this, there's this use of AI in, in the business of healthcare, right? So, like any other business where AI might be used to improve business operations, healthcare is no exception. And you could imagine AI being used there to, for example, it's been used to predict emergency department crowding, right? To do better scheduling and load balancing across the hours of a day to make sure that you know there's appropriate staffing at appropriate points in time. And also, you know, the using machine learning to predict high cost, high need patient expenditures, right? And so again, this might govern care, this might govern insurance and, and you know many other factors like that. And you'll notice I'm using AI and machine learning sort of interchangeably. This is deliberate. Um, I actually, you know, I'll say more about this in a bit, but I, I don't think this distinction is important um, unless we're talking about robotic surgeries where I think the distinction between AI and machine learning is important. But for most things I'll be talking about, they're basically the same thing. And it's just uh, some people are familiar with more with one term than the other. So just for, as a note there. So why is AI used in healthcare? This is also, it's a, it seems odd because I just described a bunch of places where it is used, but I think that it's important to understand why uh, people are very interested in using AI systems in healthcare. So number one is, you know, just scientific discovery, doing things we cannot do without AI. So one, you know, quotation um, is about the use of AI and drug development. And so there's a lot of companies now that are trying to use uh, machine learning to essentially search for candidate new drugs for treatments. Idea being that you can essentially predict chemical reactions uh, using AI that you would not want to actually run uh, in the lab saving money and maybe doing things a lot faster than you would do otherwise and needing fewer resources. So this is just one example, but I think across the sciences in general, and again, the medical science is no exception, the idea of using AI to do discovery um, uh, is, is a very attractive and powerful one that people have been thinking about. Another thing is about doing things efficiently, faster, cheaper, and scale. That's sort of an, a famous and now infamous quote by a, a well-known, a very famous uh, deep learning researcher who got the Turing Award, the Computer Science Equivalent Nobel Prize a few years ago, who said in 2016 and got a lot of outcry for it, saying we should just stop training radiologists. We're not going to need them anymore in five years. Well, it, it's been six years, and um, depending on your perspective, thankfully or not, he was wrong. But it is very clear now that um, AI is being used in even radiology and other places to help make things more efficient and take on more tedious tasks that you know doctors, uh, uh, clinicians in general, and, and experts and technology and you know technical people in the radiology space would not you know would take a lot of time doing. So it's helping routine tasks, you know, and prioritizing workflow and then things like that. So while the, the claims, the hype around the use of AI have not come to pass, there's definitely been a lot of movement and a lot of you know, use of AI for things like efficiency. And finally, consistency, right? So there's a lot of human variability naturally in the process of delivering care that could affect care. And you know, we would like to, as far as possible, maintain patient-specific approaches, but, but allow for consistency where consistency actually makes sense. Right. And so one again, I'm not just giving you one example of how I mentioned this earlier. If you have AI systems that can record clinical con conversations that might be less prone to error than someone actually having to transcribe it you know, by hand later on or do sort of manual data entry of various kinds. So to so the extent that you can remove humans in the process of data entry and use uh, AI, this is viewed as an attractive uh, substitution to make and also attractive for the people involved because that's often viewed as a very tedious task and therefore leads to more errors in the process. So I've given you a little bit of where, you know, of some of the sample places where AI is currently being used in, in the world of healthcare and also why. 
And maybe uh, I want to do a brief interlude talking about the kinds of AI systems are used. I'm not going to get too technical in here, but just to give you a sense of what things tend to pop up most often. And maybe there's also a good time to stop and make sure if everyone has any questions or clarifications, I can take them right now before I move on. Not seeing anything in chat, but yeah, feel free to put questions um, throughout and we'll have some stopping points um, to address questions um, throughout the presentation as well as at the end. Thank you, Liz. So some of the more key technologies within AI that get used in the medical space are number one, natural language processing. So what does this roughly mean? It means taking data coming from natural language. Now this could be text data. So say for example, your health records or a, tra a transcript of a conversation, or it could even in some cases be audio signals, right? People talking and just recording that signal. So when I say natural language, I mean, typically people mean text, but I mean both text and audio signals. And then converting that into more structured information. So you might convert health records into a, a nice spreadsheet or a table somewhere so you can actually look up and do searches on it. You might wanna convert audio signals into again, sort of an early detection for a disease diagnosis. And so, you know, these are, NLP shows up a lot. I'll, I'll say NLP just as a, it's a thing that that's how we call them in, in, in the tech world, uh, natural language processing. NLP shows up a lot in the space and it's, it's, a, it's an important tool, especially given the vast amount of text records that are lying out there that people are trying to digitize and convert into, into some structured form to be searched. Another, of course, very important component is what is called computer vision or imaging, basically. So computer vision makes it sound like you're do, look, just trying to look at how, to simulate how people see things. That is one part of it. But more broadly, you know, you have other kinds of imaging technologies. You have x-rays, you have MRIs, you have CD scans, you have so many other kinds of things, which are devices seeing essentially the world, all right, or seeing inside a person's body and then trying to process that data automatically. So for example, the most basic thing you might wanna do is take a chest x-ray and read it automatically and segment out different parts of it. This is just an illustration of trying to set on the left side, trying to segment out the lungs and the heart the lower row is what a machine is doing in this example, but the R1 is what a doctor might actually draw out on this, right? So, and, and you know, again, you know, there are places where they do reasonably well, there are places where they do less well, and depending on the pipeline in which these systems are being used, the error rate can matter more or less. And I'll say more about that in a bit. Another example of this could be using um, scanning systems to scan for, uh, things like melanomas, right? Um, whether you can you can automatically segment. The idea of the, the process of putting lines around what looks like a problematic area on the skin is called segmentation, right? this, at least the image segmentation into parts and then trying to do further analysis on that. So again, computer vision imaging for a long time has been a very key part of the pipeline of, of tools within the world of uh, medical care. And um, that's another, so a lot of AI gets used in now. In fact, I would say computer vision and NLP are the two areas where deep learning has made the most inroads over the last 10 years. First in vision and now in NLP. And of course, there are broader sort of tools, right, from machine learning in general, right? So the two that I will talk about, there are many others, of course, are regression and classification. Regression is, you know, and again, this is not really owned by machine learning, but, you know, uh, it's, it's a notion that's been around for a very long time. The idea that you have, you know, dependent variables and independent variables, and you want to find some trend line in patterns. Maybe it's a dose response graph or something like that although those may not be linear. But anyway, you wanna find some linear relationship or some other relationship between the independent dependent variable and you use some tools to do that. You might also want to build what is called a classifier. So you may want to make a prediction. Think about this way, given the, given the uh, brain scan data, what is the likelihood that a person is you know, showing early warning signs for some neurodegenerative disease, maybe let's say Alzheimer's. And so you can think of this either as a probability outcome or there's a 70% chance that the scan represent someone who might be showing signs well, or you could think of it as a binary decision, a zero or one. Either way, this process is called classification. And that's another very important tool. It's, you can think of this as capturing any kind of prediction system. You can want to predict whether a patient will be susceptible to sepsis after a surgery, whether a patient will incur a certain level of cost. So the, it's a very general tool in machine learning that gets used all over the place in, in this world. And of course, now that I come to machine learning, I want to emphasize, you know, the one slide of everything you need to know about machine learning. Well, not really. You have another talk next week that'll tell you more about this. But what's important to remember in any tool that uses machine learning, and that's why here is actually the term is important, is that it's always learning from data, which means that someone, somewhere, some group has collected, if you're trying to solve a problem using machine learning, someone has collected data with all the inputs that you would give to the system and the outputs. In other words, it has all the questions and answers already accumulated for the most part. This is called supervised learning if you are, want to get technical. 
And so that data is collected. It's called the train data. It's used to build a model. And then that model is applied to new data to give answers. And the reason I'm stopping here and emphasizing this is because, you know, and we'll talk more about this in a bit, that training data is very important. And the way you train the model is very important. And often in conversations around AI, we tend to forget this part that we think, oh, it would be nice to do so-and-so task. The first question you have to ask yourself is, where am I going to get data that has questions and answers that I can use to guide an algorithm that wants to solve this task? So this is, um, maybe this wasn't so brief, but it was definitely an interlude, just talking about the various technologies that show up a lot. And there are many others, of course, right? I haven't talked anything about genomic data and sequence analysis and all those things. But these are where, you know, the new interest in machine learning has typically been coming from. So what are some of the problems we face when we, when we, when we start deploying um, AI in, in the medical world? And again, I'm going to give you examples of problems. And then after that, I'm going to try and put them into a larger analysis of why these problems come up. This is not to say that all uses of AI in healthcare have problems, or that they will have problems. But these examples are illustrative. They've been, you know, they've drawn a lot of attention, of course, but they're illustrative of a broader set of issues that we need to be concerned about if and when we want to deploy AI in the healthcare setting. And so you can think of the examples as sort of ways to lock into that or to get into that broader perspective. So I'll first give you the examples and give you that broader perspective as well. So what are these um, problems? So again, you've probably heard of some of these, but let me just talk about a few of them. One well-known example came in the context of melanoma detection. Um, I mentioned image segmentation, right? And I mentioned how you know the system has to sort of mark out where on the skin the evidence of the tumor might be. It turns out that you know the computer vision that gets used to do this is often very is often trained. Remember the training data? It's often trained on white skin or fair skin. And it doesn't seem to do that well on darker skin. This could be because of different contrast. This could be because maybe the tumor manifests differently on darker skins. Uh, again, not being a doctor, I'm not familiar with that, but I do know that what we've seen is that these systems do not work as well for thing, for darker skin people. And this shows up in many contexts. It's not just for melanoma detection, even just something as simple as putting your hands under a an automated system to, you know, in a, in a bathroom in an airport to get the water out they often don't work as well for dark, darker skinned people as opposed to lighter skinned people. And you know, I don't need to point out the, the immediate sort of disparity implications for this kind of problem, right? If a system cannot tell, cannot do as well on darker skinned folks and lighter skinned folks, then its value as an early warning system is correspondingly less, right? And so that's one sort of issue that has been of concern now for a while with the use of computer vision systems in particular. Another um, sort of problem that has been publicized is the, again, the, you know, there are these systems that are used for sepsis prediction hospitals. They're used all over the place. And it turns out that these systems do not work as claimed, right? Now, there are many reasons for this and people have gone into the reason. I'll briefly talk about the touch up a little later. But the point is that there's a sort of a surprising fact that the way the system was claimed to work, whatever accuracy, efficacy bounds it was given, percentage probably false negatives, false positives, did not pan out when actually deployed in a real setting. And that's sort of a concern because then if we can't trust how these systems are claimed or published to have been uh, effective, and if they don't seem to match what they say in experimental in a lab versus what they do in reality, then we're not sure we can trust these systems to begin with. Predicting need for care. So I mentioned that one you know, application of AI and ML is to predict you know, what kind of care profile a person might need entering given their pre-existing conditions, what they're presenting with and so on. And there's a you know, fairly well-known paper that appeared in Science a couple of years ago, talked about how there's these algorithms manifest racial bias without even intending to. And that's, I think, where this becomes very tricky and, and, and uh, hard to unwrap as, as well. So the result of the paper <coughs> was that when patients were being assigned risk of you know, needing escalated care, black patients assigned the same level of risk by the algorithm as white patients were in fact sicker. In other words, the algorithm thought they were at the same level of risk and it was wrong because black patients were actually sicker, which means that if the level of risk was say, you know, considered low and the treatment plan was designed accordingly, then that would not cater to the black patients correctly in the way that it would cater to white patients. And in particular, the authors estimated this racial bias 
reduce the number of black patients identified for extra care by more than half. So that's, you know, this, this, this came out, I think this is one of the papers I think that sort of kicked off this much broader discussion about health disparities. And, and in fact, this paper is interesting because the way in which this happened was very subtle. Um, I, I may not get into this in the presentation itself. I'm happy to talk with people one-on-one -on -one in the or in the Q&A, but it just shows that a, a thing that is, I think, a, a concern of mine in general is that we think of these AI ML systems as black boxes that we can just put plug and play into a broader infrastructure for doing uh, for, for treating patients. But the design process by which these systems are built can make a huge difference to the outcomes. And the way they're currently done where a third party builds a tool and just gives it over to say a hospital does not allow for that more direct dialogue that needs to happen between the developers and those who are going to use it and those who are going to be impacted by it. I might return to this later. Finally, um, we talked about racial uh, bias in computer vision. Another element of this is racial bias in natural language processing. In other words, in processing of the electronic health records. So it turns out here, this is the, at least in this particular paper, the issue was not so much that the algorithm was introducing bias, but that it was picking up on societal biases, on, on broader biases in the way the records were constructed. So, you know, uh, doctors were adding uh, notes and descriptors in their records, and there was unfortunately a, a negative set of a more a preponderance of negative descriptors for black patients compared to white patients. And the algorithm, again, remember training data, the algorithm would pick up on these patterns in the data. And we've known this is true for NLP for a long time now. It will that that it will essentially construct biased outcomes pick, by picking up on biased phrasings and language in the text itself. So these are some of the problems or examples of problems that we've seen in uh, the deployment of AI in, in the healthcare industry. And again, by saying these are anecdotes, I don't mean to either say they're rare or that they're very common. The truth is we often don't know. For all of these, it takes a while for the problems to manifest, for someone to discover, often journalists or investigative reporters from the outside, and force discovery of an issue like this. So these are not easy to come by. Uh, that's an, and that issue of transparency is yet another problem with the use of AI in these systems. So let me do it as I promised, right? What I wanted to do was lift up a bit uh, up, upwards from the examples and try to say, well, why do these problems occur? Are these one-offs? Is it something specific in each case that we have to address in that specific case? Or are there patterns of um, misdeployment that we can learn from as we try to do better? So here's one general set of problem. You remember that picture I showed you a little while ago about how the typical machine learning process works, right? Your, your one slide intro to machine learning or supervised learning. There are a couple of things that you know often don't get said or are conveniently dropped when these systems are being sold or, or, or touted for their success rates. These models that we build are often, they look very effective but they're only effective under a certain number of conditions. And again, these are, when I say certain conditions, these can be actually proven mathematically. So there are mathematical properties of these, of these models that say essentially when they're going to perform with some degree of felicity. For one thing, the test data and the trained data should be drawn from the same underlying distribution. And that's a tricky thing, especially with multimodal data, because then you're asking for two very high dimensional distributions where you often don't have a lot of data, right? Um, where you expect that the training and test data are drawn from the same distribution. This is often very hard to achieve, especially if you know a company will develop a tool by using data from one hospital system in one part of the country and then try to deploy it in a different hospital system in a different part of the country. Now there are ways to try and address these concerns to way and sort of map out the differences between data sets or distributions from different spaces and, and put that into the training process that often doesn't get done well. Because again, it goes back to cost and efficacy and you know the, the whole point of building an automated system is that you build it once and you can sell it multiple times. This is, you know, this may be a little bit cynical, but it's also unfortunately somewhat true that cost incentives and other incentives predicate against doing very boutique custom training for individual settings. And not to mention the fact that there isn't often a lot of data to do boutique custom training for these things. So that's one issue. Test and train data must be drawn the same distribution for these models to be accurate or to be reliably accurate when applied on unknown data. 
the training data itself needs to be big enough. And what I mean by big enough is that there need to be enough points in it. There need to be data from enough people relative to the number of features. So again, one of the incentives for using AI is that you can combine multiple different sources of data. But that gives you a descriptor for an individual that has multiple features in it. And the more features you put in, the more individuals you need in order to be confident that what you're finding out is a true pattern and not some weird artifact of the data you've overfit on. And so that's often difficult to do, especially with you know, sort of some, some kinds of rare diseases. You don't really have a lot of data. You might have 100 patients or 200 patients, but you might have 200 or 300 features. And if you're doing imaging, you have a lot because often each pixel is often treated as a feature or groups of pixels are treated as one feature. So that you know, also compromises the accuracy of these models when applied on new data. So again, you know, anyone who, who tries to deploy one of these systems will produce test results, will produce evidence that they're accurate. The question is not that. The question is what happens when you give them new data that the system hasn't seen before? That's where the learning is supposed to come in. And that's where these concerns come. A final concern with training is that, again, the train data needs to be big enough, again, enough points, enough you know, people's data relative to the complexity of the model. So let me sort of try to explain what that means. You can try to say that there is a, a linear relationship between some independent variable and dependent variable. So that's linear. You might say, well, in fact, that there's a quadratic relationship between some independent variable and a dependent variable. That's a quadratic relationship. And in a very specific way, the quadratic relationship is more complex than the linear relationship, just because you need more numbers to describe a quadratic function than you need to describe a linear function. Right? You need two numbers for a linear function in two dimensions. You need three numbers for a quadratic function in two dimensions, and so on. Now imagine the use of deep nets, neural, neural networks, or deep learning. The number of parameters that, that are used to describe these models can go into the billions, if not larger, because each essentially layer of a neural network or each neuron or each gate in a neural network has a bunch of numbers associated with it to weight the signals coming into it and to weight the signal going out. And there's millions and millions of these individual gates and layers. So, while on the one hand, there is a push towards ever increasing complexity of models. If you've heard of these models for large language models and NLP, they have billions of parameters. But to effectively train on billions of parameters, you need lots more data than you would for a linear classifier. So this trade-off between the complexity of the model, how much data you need and how accurate your systems are is again something that's very important that technicians, the technical folks are aware of, but often get sort of pushed to the side when these systems are being pushed out or sold uh, in, the, in these contexts. So that these are just some of the key issues with how model training can be affected by the way we collect data and what data we collect and how we design the models. Another issue is with the data itself. You know, people often say, well, all problems with machine learning is with the data. The previous slide hopefully convinced you that's not the case. But data is a problem because data is the input and it, you know, as they say in computer science, garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data, you shouldn't expect a good model to come from it. So what does that mean? If you want your machine learning algorithm to be effective and not manifest and amplify disparities, your data should be representative of different populations, which is again, often hard to do. Your data must not have hidden proxies. So you might say, well, I'm not gonna collect race or gender information because I don't want my algorithm to pick up on those signals and become biased, great. Are you collecting employment history? Are you collecting educational attainment? Are you collecting uh, zip codes? Because of you know, the way our society functions, and you know, that's a whole other discussion to have here, and you know, I'm not even the most qualified person to have that one, there are most of the proxies and the data we use on people is drenched with socioeconomic factors, including race, including issues around gender that are very hard to tease out. And so, Maybe when I say must not, I said, we should at least be aware of and counter for the existence of proxies like race and gender. Another problem is this, especially now as a machine learning is becoming more and more prevalent in the world, we have this problem, what I'll call derived features. Namely, one machine learning algorithm is used to produce some output set of numbers. Those numbers are treated as inputs to another machine learning algorithm and so on. So this, as you can imagine, if there's errors in one system and those erroneous outputs are then plugged in another system, they become now a data problem for the next system and then so on and so on and so forth. And what's worse is that this chain reaction can loop back in on itself. For example, you might have a system that's you know, um, looking at 
um, hospital admissions and deciding whether to admit someone to the ER or not based on some triage calculations. You might have another system that looks like how many times people who are admitted to the hospital to decide something about their care. And as you can see, these things will feed, and then and, and then that might that that system might again then feed back into what your risk of of uh, disease is when you go back to the ER again the next time. So not only can you have these chain reactions of ML systems plugging into ML systems plugging into ML systems, they can loop back on each other. And we know that these can cause serious problems for the accuracy and reliability of these systems. There are also broader questions with the sort of the socio-technical apparatus. And what I mean by that is that we, we, we should think of, and I mentioned earlier, we shouldn't think of machine learning as being a plug and play kind of approach where you have some systems, someone made a decision, you take the person out, put the machine and everything looks fine. It doesn't. So this is uh, in the realm of the study of science, technology and society. And what you know, you know, we have actually sort of looked at before is this issue of what happens when you take a machine learning model trained in one context and use another context. We call this the portability trap. It's a trap because Again, we are incentivized to do this because it, the model looks like it's portable. Hey, I can build a classifier here for this problem and run it there for that problem. We teach students, frankly, in computer science that we can think about classification as a problem regardless of what the domain is. It's a feature, not a bug. But the problem is that models don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a broader context. And you take them out of the context and put them in a different context. They are unlikely to work the same way, even if you have numbers saying they work very well in one context. Another problem with the use of models that even if they, they have some outputs that might be interpretable, people often don't, don't correctly interpret the predictions. This is the interpretability problem, the explainability problem, you can call it what you want. But if a, if a system says there is a 70% or a lo low risk of an individual, you know, uh, individual's brain scan suggesting uh, Alzheimer's, what does low mean? What does that mean? You know, why is the system saying that? What is it keying off of? For example, we know systems that are able to make what look like very accurate predictions, but based on the time of day of the scan. And that seems an odd thing to ha happen without further explanation. But if you didn't know the system was using time of day as a feature and was keying off that feature to make a prediction, you wouldn't be able to be suspicious about this. So the issue of transparency and explainability is another question. Users often unreasonably trust the output of a model. This is called automation bias in the literature, that you know whether or not uh, the system is reliable, or even if your system loudly proclaims its errors, people start trying to people start assuming it works fine. You know, my one of my friends drives a Tesla and he has the you know the auto autopilot feature, and I think Tesla will say you know officially legally this is not autopilot. We just call it autopilot. It doesn't, you shouldn't be letting go of the wheel, but he's admitted that like oh yeah he just let the autopilot drive for him. We, he trusts the system more than it should be trusted, even with the appropriate disclaimers. In. And so um, one you know, very nice example of this was a study of the use of sepsis uh, prediction systems um, in hospitals. This was actually done with you know, anthropologists sitting in on the deployment of the system at, at, the, at the Duke Institute for Health Innovation. And they observed that you, know, it was, you couldn't just plug the system in by itself. It required an entire ecosystem, including the caregivers, the nurses, the doctors, to sort of adjust their behavior appropriately around the system. And that adjustment had to, be ha had to happen in a thoughtful way to make sure the system was actually effective. Right? So this is, a, this is why I call this a socio-technical system. There are people and technologies put together, and you can't ignore the people when you put in a new piece of technology. A broader sort of question, I think this goes back to the title and the, so the premise for the stock itself, right, is what is a, a term that's been out there in the literature for a while, but has come up in the context of COVID and other, other sort of modern issues with healthcare, is what is called the inverse equity hypothesis. Right? When health innovations emerge, they're initially adopted by wealthy and connected segments of the population, thereby amplifying rather than reducing inequality. So even if your system works well, even if you made sure that you've trained it correctly, even if you've managed to reduce disparities in the training process as much as possible, even if you're thoughtful about injecting it into a, into a particular hospital system or wherever you're trying to use it, it's still, there are still inequities that appear just because the broader infrastructure of healthcare delivery in this country, you know, for, because of decades and centuries of history is inequ inequitable, regardless of how effective the treatment is. And again, this has been seen over and over again in the case of COVID and delivery of care, testing facilities, vaccines, and so on. And the message here is not that you know, we, you know, we can't solve all of society's problems, but that if we are making claims about the efficacy of AI systems, 
we cannot evaluate these claims in a vacuum. We have to be a lot more thoughtful about how we do it. So I've you know, delivered a lot of doom and gloom on this topic, right? Of all the problems that things have and people are like, well, come on, Suresh, you're, you know, you're a technologist. You can't just sit here and tell us everything's terrible and we shouldn't use technology. And I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that. I actually personally think that of all the places where people are using tech, medicine is one of the more promising ones because you know, at some level, you know, to be very crude about this, people either get better or they don't. There are sort of things very, you know, many, many objective ways to tell if systems are being effective or not that are not true in many other settings. Uh, so I think there's a lot of promise here. However, we need to be careful and we need to be thoughtful about how we do it. I should mention, whoops, let me let me stop that. This automatically plays and I didn't want it to. Uh, I should mention that, you know, Liz mentioned that I worked last year. Uh, I just got off a stint at OSTP, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, developing this blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which I'll talk about in a minute. But as part of this work, we ran a bunch of convenings with experts in different domains. And we did one particular summit on health and the issues of race and health. It was a really fascinating hour and a half of discussion. I encourage all of you to watch the, uh, the video. It's on YouTube. Uh, it was uh, organized jointly with OSTP and the Center for American Progress. And there's a, it was a wide ranging discussion about uh, healthcare, about the use of AI, what concerns about race, about the way in which social determinants of health can color the use of AI systems and so on. So that's just a plug for that. So what should we do differently? How should we not just give up on the use of tech in the medical space, but try to be more thoughtful and careful about it? I think the first thing I would say, and I find this is often the hardest thing for people to accept, which is a pity because it's, it, it's the most important one I think is we need to have realistic expectations. AI is not magic no matter how many people will try to sell you that kind of snake oil. And it is not a cheap and easy fix for problems. There's a very nice paper that colleagues of mine have written called the fallacy of AI functionality. It's a sort of a serious title for what the title they wanted to write was AI snake oil. And what they do in this paper is outline all the ways in which when we spend time talking about bias and unfairness in AI systems and how it has inequities, we rarely if ever talk about the fact that often these systems just don't work. They, their accurate claims of accuracy are not based on actual experimental work in, in, the, in, in real spaces. They are based on hyped claims about what the technology could be doing. They're based on incorrect assumptions about the problem to be solved versus what the system is actually solving. It's really, really important to sort of strip away the hype because there's a lot of pressure because of cost effectiveness, because of you know the coolness of AI, because of the attractiveness of you know the, the, you know just the weird new science and all the headlines we see that we should use AI everywhere. It is not magic. It is not a cheap and easy fix. What happens is it's sold as a cheap and easy fix, and then fixing the problems that AI causes makes you realize it actually wasn't that cheap to begin with. So that's the first thing I would say. We need realistic expectations, and having had realistic expectations, it's important to understand where it can work well. So there are many places where AI can be helpful. For example, as a way to generate possible hypotheses about a complex prediction problem. This is very general, but again, you know, if, you're, if your system is picking up on certain patterns in multimodal data and seems to be effective at early diagnosis of some problem, what that tells you is, huh, there is something interesting in this data. This AI system is able to find some pattern. What could it be? With my knowledge of medicine, with my knowledge of biology and genetics, what could that be? So as hypothesis generation, these tools can be very helpful. They've been effective in the life sciences. They've been helpful in the physical sciences to be that sort of, here, here let me give you a, a sort of an idea to think about. They're also effective as a way to find patterns of prediction for a well-defined task. And remember what's well-defined for a computer is not what it means to be well-defined for a person. So I don't know if you've ever done this with your kids. When my kids were young, we'd sort of pretend to play robot. And so they were the programmer for the robot and I was a robot. And they would tell me things to do and I would do literally what they told me to do. And it turned out for them to be very frustrating because they would tell me to walk forward and I walked forward and I wouldn't stop and I would keep walking forward. And they didn't mean that I should just keep walking forward and hit a wall, which was not that painful, but, <laughs> but, but, but they wanted me to stop. But I said, you didn't tell me to stop. You just said to walk forward. And so just, it was a, you know, it was a more, maybe more fun game for me than for them, uh, I admit. But, it, but it's also something that we have to keep in mind that computers will only will do what we tell them to do, not what we want them to do. And so as long as your task is extremely well-defined and the gap between want and need is, is, is nothing, it's not there, then you're fine. But if you're trying to do something ambiguous, right? You want to say, 
does a patient need extra care? That's a very ambiguous question. You may be able to unpack it in 10 different ways. And for one of those ways, you might be able to build a predictive system. But that as itself is a very high level thing, which may not be able to manifest as a well-defined task. So thinking through something that you want and figuring out whether it is in fact well-defined or not, and often that requires having multiple stakeholders at the table to say, well, actually this, you know, there are multiple ways to think about this question, helps understand where ML can be effective. And again, you know, ML is effective to represent and integrate multimodal data into a single representation in a way that you know, people find it hard to do. As a, with the appropriate caveat saying, you, know, you have to again, think of it as hypothesis generation, as, oh, when I put this new signal in, things got better, why? As opposed to saying, I put this new signal in, things got better, okay, I'm done. Right? Think of it as opening conversations rather than closing them up. And of course, you, know, you have to deploy these systems very carefully. Now, the document that we put out this actually a few weeks ago called a Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights is about making automated systems work for the American people. And it outlines five principles. Systems should be safe and effective. They should work. They shouldn't be biased. They should protect our data and not use it uh, needlessly. They should be transparent and accountable. And there should be human backups to the system at all times so that we're not reliant solely on the use of an automated system. But what this also has is very, very detailed expectations for systems, how to test for errors, how to do reporting on these systems, how to validate them, how to bring in external stakeholders in. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a long document. If we just wanted to outline the principles, it'd be three pages long, but it's actually 73 pages long. So I would encourage you to take a look at it if you like. We spend a lot of time talking, especially about health data and where health and why health settings are both promising, but we have to be careful about how we deploy these systems. With that, I'll conclude. Um, at about 45 minutes in, and I thank you for listening to me. Uh, once again, if you have any more questions, you can reach me at sureshabrown.edu. I'm part of the Data Science Initiative, and I'm starting a new Center for Tech Responsibility soon uh, that will sort of spend a lot more time thinking about this, and I'm looking forward to working with folks at Advanced CTR on many of these topics. Thank you. Oh, perfect timing. Um, I think that was really great. I think you touched upon all of the key points um, that really for anyone who's trying to work in this space um, should know. Um, we do have a some comments in the Q&A. So um, I think when you were talking about racial bias, we had a comment about trained on racially biased historical management that then propagates bias forward, for example, need for C-section, so ergo structural racism. So I think really supporting um, what you were saying um, at that part of the presentation. Um, we also have a comment about sharing the link to the deployment doc. I think what this presentation is being recorded, so will be posted on YouTube and we can also share um, the links um, that showed up in, in this presentation as well. Yep. Um, yep. So I think the question is... Yeah, I can, I, can, uh, I mean, it's pretty easy just to Google White House AI, AI will erase and you'll find it, but I'm happy to share a link to it as well. And so it's a, it's a, you can read it on, on your phone, you can read it as a PDF, you can read it in many different ways. Perfect. So I know sometimes there's a lot of questions, but yes, please feel free to put any questions. I know there's a number of you working in this space and we know we've talked about some of these um, um, things that um, Suresh has been talking about. So feel free as you know, our expert, um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, but while we wait, I had a couple of questions. One is, you know, we are talking about data and we say this all the time, garbage in, garbage out, you know, um, but one of the challenges, you know, with health data is it really is messy, you know, particularly electronic health records, just even finding one variable can be very challenging. Sometimes it's in structured data, sometimes it's in notes, um, sometimes it's inconsistent. And, and, you know, so we're always struggling with these data quality issues before we can actually even do machine learning. So just wondering if you have some thoughts on like what are and those are oftentimes, you know, due to cultural reasons or documentation practices at a particular um, healthcare institution. But how do we kind of address that? Because that's really where the data come from. Um, but there's so many challenges with just the data itself um, before right. we can actually do the AI. Right. So um, I'll answer that, but I also want to address, uh, address the comment you mentioned about, you know, other examples people are providing about structural uh, biases, and they mentioned C sections. One of the things that I think I didn't mention the slides. I'd written a slide, then I sort of removed it. But I want to say here is that it, is, it has been very helpful in other settings. So one of the settings that I'm very familiar with, two of the things I'm very familiar with are criminal justice, um, the use of AI in criminal justice, and the use of AI in hiring. And in both those settings, most of these problems arise in just different ways. They manifest in different ways, but the same problems arise. What has been very helpful is being 
a lot of research on mapping out the different pressure points in the pipeline of decision making and where the nature of the issues that come up when using data or bias data or AI systems. In other words, being very specific to the domain of interest and building a, a sort of a literature of understanding around the different stages in the pipeline where problems can occur. Now you mentioned, for example, data cleaning. The health data is very messy, great. Um, there has been research, for example, on what it would mean to build essentially um, a data sheet, it's called for a data set, uh, kind of like a spec sheet for electronic part but the idea is that with a data set that people are using for some problem, there should be a kind of a spec sheet that talks about the where the data was collected, from what kind of population, what kind of demographic differences and variations are there in the population, uh, other information that might be relevant to sort of glean where biases could be coming from in the data, uh, what noise, you know, noisiness is there in certain features and how that's been mitigated, what process. So that information as a kind of an accompaniment to the data set, if it came along with it, it would give the people then trying to build a system downstream a lot more information about what was in the data and where it, and what its provenance was so that when they do look at inferences coming out of the data set, they have a better sense of where the problems might be coming from. So this has been taken up a little bit in certain settings. I, I would say it's not widespread yet, but it's something that you know companies are talking about, people working in NLP are trying to build data sheets for NLP problems specifically. And I think this would be very helpful in the medical space, especially with the kinds of messy and complex data that, uh, that people deal with, to think about what it might mean to build a spec for a data set as, that goes along with it as it moves around. That's great. I think we have a hand raised um, from Krishmit. Hey, Liz, thanks. Um, sure, so that was a great talk. I just wanted to comment. I actually was the one of the statisticians on one of the sort of infamous cases of, of algorithmic bias, which was the GFR prediction model that got uh, profiled in the New York Times a couple of years ago. Sorry, um, what is GFR? The, the, oh, sorry, the, the kidney function, um, ah, okay. glomerular filtration rate. So, you know, I worked with a group about 15 years ago we published a model called the CKD epi model that some people might be familiar with, um, where we had a coefficient for, for um, black race. And this coefficient actually showed that the uh, people from Africa of African American origin self-reported um, had higher kidney function than people who didn't. There was a positive coefficient there. And so, of course, that leads to the same thing that you were talking about, which is that when people are on the cusp of needing dialysis or needing treatment, that they're not going to get it if less likely to get it if they're black than if they're not. And I just wanted to comment on because you had made a couple of um, statements about you know how these things arise. Uh, when we had put that model together, we had we had taken a whole lot of databases which had GFR data, which were hard to collect. And one of the one of the primary um, uh, sources of data on African Americans was called the African American Study of Kidney Disease, which was a study that basically is just African Americans, and that was the majority, I think, of the data that we had on African Americans. And so, you know, as a statistician, obviously, we were playing around with all kinds of different nonlinear models, and we had these spline models and all this kind of thing. But of course. What we didn't really take into account that we probably should have was that, that was one source of data. And so that, you know, if the people in that study were somehow different from people in the general run of the mill um, treatment, that, that we would get the wrong answer or we would get an answer that was tailored to them and not to others. Um, and so that's one way this kind of thing can, it's not necessarily, you know, we certainly didn't have any bias and we weren't even right. trying to build a model, right. but that was just right. how the data came about. That's what we Correct. had. And I think that's what happens a lot of times is scientists have certain data sources and they use them and they don't maybe think carefully about how those data sources might themselves not be representative. Oh, completely. And I, I really appreciate your point about this. And I think it's worth sort of doubling down on what you said. These do not arise out of any actual effort to do anything problematic. They arrive, they arrive, arise sort of almost, I don't want to say unintentionally, but sort of very in a very implicit sort of invisible way because of the way data is collected and the, what we don't know about data collection processes and we, what we don't know about where they're coming from. And I think you mentioned that, you know, you identified that positive coefficient that sort of gave a signal to you. One of the, you know, efforts that has had now a, a good amount of 
uh, development in the CS world, in the machine learning world, is how do we build models that are explainable by design, right? Where you can actually understand what the model prediction and why it's making the prediction. You know, if it's a linear system and you look at coefficients, you can do that. But if you have a nonlinear system, it's a bit hard to understand what influence of a feature on the outcome looks like and how should we go about doing that. So there's an active research space now trying to quantify and make more precise this idea of influence and outcomes and to help, you know, people diagnose well. I built this model, it seems to predict this. I wonder why it's doing that and wonder why this feature is having so much influence. Uh, let me go back and dig in a bit more into this. So I think what you're describing, uh, Chris, is, is very important, the sort of conversation that needs to happen about this. We, we should do what we can, but we should not just take the results for granted, but we sort of be a little bit more, you know, I don't want to say skeptical, but definitely sort of wonder more about the data sources and how much we're able to get. And that's why data sheet, I mentioned data sheets and mentioned other ways of doing testing for um, uh, disparity mitigation that the Bill of Rights actually talks about as well. So thanks for that. Great, so if anyone else has any questions, um, we have a little bit of time. Um, and I actually have another question. So when you're talking about how you need to have a good amount of data to, to build out these models, I mean, this question comes up all the time in our studies, you know, is our sample sizes or N big enough, you know, and um, especially if you're trying to answer uh, specific questions where the population might be small or rare diseases. Um, so how, how do we deal with that? I mean, that's the thing is these are really critical issues. We want, you know, problems, but there's not enough data. Um, right. Yeah. So this is hard, right? So, so there are a couple of different strategies. One set of strategies is, I don't have enough data on this population, but I have more data on related populations where related has to be defined very carefully. And I hope that by pooling data, I get a system that may be a little bit less accurate, but that less accuracy from pooling data is compensated for by the fact that I have more data to train on. Now, this is, again, as you can see, the way I'm saying this is you have to be very, very careful about this. You have to make good judgments about what it means to be related or not. And there is some technical guidance in this front, but still not a lot as to how to do this. In fact, a paper I'm working on one of my, with, my, with a, some students is basically this question of, if we want to mitigate biases, we could train on only one group or only another group. But if we don't have enough data for different groups, we're losing out you know, because this results will be very noisy. If we pool them together, maybe we'll do better because we have more data but maybe we have more disparities because we've pooled people from different groups. Under what conditions can we, is it better to pool? Under what conditions better not to pool? This surprisingly is a question that we don't really have a good answer to technically. And we're trying to figure out an answer to that question right now. Like, is there a flow chart? Let's say, okay, if your data looks like this and you can run this test on it, then this is the way you should pool and train. If your data looks like this and this test ran on it, then you should pool and train in this other way. So stay tuned on that front, but I think that's one thing. And another thing I will say is that what we don't have in our decision-making pipeline, unfortunately, is a way to say, I have run the following tests of reliability on my system. They have failed. I should not use the system. You'll be, you'll be shocked to know how many times I've had a conversation where, so it doesn't work. So why are you using it? Like, well, it kind of worked. Like, did you think it works well? Like, no, but we wanted, we had to do something. <laughs> and that we had to do something is a very strong pressure that pushes people towards deploying a system that they maybe invested time and effort in, instead of saying, no, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe this is actually gonna make things worse, not make things better. Um, we, we mentioned this point, uh, it's just one sentence in the, in the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. That one sentence got the most positive reaction from the public that I'd ever expected. Because th that's something that researchers have been saying for a long time, that we have to allow for the possibility that a system should not be used. I know it's very hard to accept that because you're all thinking, well, you know, maybe it'll work, but maybe it won't. So keep that in mind. Great, and I think we have one more comment and one question, which will probably be our last one, but I'll just read the comments here. I think in relation to the discussion we just had um, about um, CKD, um, also, what's an issue with CKD epi is that it was only measuring GFR, but not risk of morbidity and mortality. Yes, the average of average AA may have a greater true GFR for a given serum creatinine, but of course has a greater risk of death from ESRD than the average um, white person. The mistake was substituting GFR for risk of death and also only using GFR as the listing criteria for renal transplant. 
Um, so so I'll say, yeah, so I'll say up front, I, I only kind of understood that comment, <laughs> but uh, the, then I understood enough of it to say that this is exactly the kind of detailed conversation that needs to happen at the design stage. Right, you're using at least my inference is that GFR is being used essentially as a proxy um, uh, for risk of um, risk of death or mortality. And if you're going to use any proxies as your target prediction, make sure you understand the extent to which those proxies are good or not good for the problem you're really trying to solve or really trying to predict for. And that I, so that to the extent that I understood that was the comment was about. I I think that's very relevant for this conversation. Well, also, I mean, just I might add to that, you know, the, the purpose was it wasn't necessarily even being thought of as a proxy for transplantation. It was just a proxy for trying to diagnose what your how your kidney was doing. So, you know, nephrologists or practitioners would know how to treat somebody. But then it obviously it took on a life of its own because once right. you have that. Right. It, so so, you know, it's the unintended consequences of what right. somebody's developing. Yeah, and there's a there's a phrase that either you can it, in economics it's called a Lucas criterion, and in, in organizational theory it's called Goodhart's Goodhart's law, right? That if you use a metric to measure something, where the metric is a proxy for the thing you're trying to measure, and you keep measuring the metric and optimizing for it, sooner or later the metric will stop measuring the thing you're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. It'll take on a life of its own. It'll become the thing you optimize, but it will no longer have the connection to the thing you actually care about. So you have to be very careful about this, especially with AI systems that that build huge feedback loops into their processes. There's a question I see about regulatory environment, which is something I, I know a little bit about, so I can speak about that. So the question is, what is the regulatory system of medical AI? And uh, in, in, the, in my work, I see many medical apps that have little or no effective evaluation. So yes, this is a real problem. I think the FDA is doing something about this. They put out guidelines around the use of AI in uh, as a, thinking about AI systems as medical devices. I think that goes part of the way towards the, how to think about AI in a reasonable way. I'm not sold on the idea of AI is only a medical device, because I think the regulatory regime for devices is very different to the regulatory regime for drugs and for treatments. There's also an, uh, the, uh, the HHS has put out a new guideline or in the process of putting a new guideline around um, algorithmic discrimination in treatment care, right? In, uh, sort of adding to their guideline, I think it's 1557 on discrimination in healthcare to introduce algorithmic discrimination as well as a thing to be concerned about. So I think they're moving this direction. HHS, I would say, is one of the entities that's spending a lot of time thinking about this, but it's still early days in, in the regulatory regime around this. And I think it's still, we're waiting to see more of what will happen. Great, I think we're at time. Um... I think thank you so much for us, Suresh, for giving that really great presentation. Um, and I think we'll make sure the the links are, are disseminated. And I think those were really helpful for those who weren't able to make it kind of to see this um, presentation. Um, so our next um, presentation is next Friday um, at noon, evaluation machine learning algorithms. So I think um, ties in nicely with this presentation. Really, I, I want to attend that one yeah. <laughs> just to hear one. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. It's about different ways to evaluate machine learning algorithm right. um, that's being given to, by uh, Dr. Steingrimson in the in the Department of Biostatistics. So we hope you'll be able to join us um, then. And please, yeah, connect with Suresh. I think he provided his contact information as well as some links that I think will be very helpful for those of you who are interested in the space. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate the conversation.